This is the story of a girl who literally shot herself in the foot and went on to become one of the bravest and most effective spies of World War II. Today we are chatting with Heather Demetrius, the author of Codename Badass, the true story of Virginia Hall. So let me see if I can add Heather now. I always end up spelling here. Spell Heather. Okay, cool. Heather is invited. So I'm glad that we're only getting around to doing this video now, two months after the book came out, because I think it makes a really great holiday gift for the person on your list who is really bright and of a, say, let's say, unconventional bent, someone who wants to do things differently in their life, wants to choose for themselves, but like might be feeling kind of uncertain about the path that they want to take. So this isn't just, you know, teen readers, but everyone. I found this biography tremendously inspiring. It's one of my two, my top two biographies of all time. The other one is The Queen of the Wits by Norma Clark, um, which is another really, really amazing woman who endured tremendous hardship and violent misogyny in her life and turned it around and made an amazing life for herself. So um, it looks like that invite didn't go through, Heather. Let me see if I can invite you now. Is this going to work? Can I hear you? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yay. So my, my question for you, so we're going to get into a couple of questions that um, our friend Chantal submitted for you. But my first question for you is, why Dindy, why now? Um, I mean, I think this is a time when so many... Um, women who have been invisible historically are having their stories come to light. I think in large part because of the amazing work that so many female activists, um, female identifying activists have been doing, you know, to bring these stories to light and, and also tell their own stories like the Me Too movement, you know? And so um, I think <laughs> I like to, I like to say that I have a holy anger <laughs> And uh, like a holy fury. And I feel like when I went to the spy museum, um, which for anyone who you know hasn't heard me say this before, so I found out about Dindy because I went to the International Spy Museum in Washington, DC. And I just happened upon a, a small part of the exhibit that featured her. And I'd never heard of her. And I thought, I can't believe I'm a World War II buff and a spy nerd. Like I couldn't believe I'd never heard of her. And I felt like so angry. Like why, why are people writing about this incredible woman? And so um, I felt like that was sort of a continuation of decades of, you know, being a feminist and being, you know, having this holy fury, but also just, I feel like she is a person who felt so invisible and I feel like in this heightened time of visibility, I mean, look at us, we're on Instagram Live. What the hell is that even, right? Um, it's like people, it's like, yes, you can be more visible, but you're also more invisible. And so, I don't know, it just felt like now is the time, you know, to have her story come out. And some weird thing is happening because a bunch of us at the same time discovered her. And started sharing her story in wildly different ways from like a novel to like a graphic novel, <clears throat> excuse me, to all kinds of movies. Like it's just crazy all at the same time. So I don't know. She's somewhere telling us that she wants to be seen now. <laughs> um, so you sort of answered one of Chantal's questions, which was while writing, when did you feel closest to Virginia? What made you really get a phone away? 
actually you sort of have an answer both of these. What made you really get a feel for her character? So I guess the way that I would ask this question, given what you just said is like, why you to write this version? And, and we should also say that like, you, you really wanted to come at it from a unique angle of, you know, the really smart drunk history version, like to make this a really, really entertaining and accessible biography that is also impeccably researched. Like you have so many, so many pages of, of endnotes and, you know, your primary sources are amazing. And so, but I want to know why, so like all of this is important, um, but what was that, like, what, what did you feel like in that moment when you found her in the spy museum? What made you feel like you had to be the one to tell her story in this specific way? You know, the voice of the book just came to me. Like, it was really weird. Like, I, because I had never written a biography. I'm a novelist um, by trade. And um, I immediately just felt like it had to be a biography. And the voice just was in there. I mean, it only ever sounded this way. Um, and so that was interesting. And I always go with my gut on that kind of thing. But in terms of that question of when did I feel closest to her and why me, like kind of a combo of that question and answer would be, um, you know, I have written about a lot about feeling invisible in different ways, but also feeling less than in different ways. Um, for example, um, so I teach, as you know, meditation and I'll do these recorded meditations for writers, which I've always felt very self-conscious about because I am literally a valley girl. Like I am from the valley and have always felt like I have a valley girl accent. And historically, you know, if you have an accent like that, people think that you're dumb, right? And I'm from Los Angeles, blah, blah, blah. And there's so much messaging around, um, you know, aspects of my family of origin and upbringing and things that have all pointed to you're dumb. You're not smart enough to be in this club. So whenever I picked up, you know, a biography and they're almost all written by white West. Most of them are academics, historians, scholars, you know, journalists, serious people um, with, you know, what Oxbridge people. And so I, I felt like you seem to be having some technical difficulties. Darn it. <clears throat> Oh, you're totally frozen. I hope you come back soon. Darn it. Okay, let's try to get you back in here, Heather. Are you back? Okay. I, am I back? Yes, you're back. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, it's so, the timing is so funny. I, how, I, I love the universe. Okay. Um, how silly. So yeah, anyway, so very, very serious, you know, people. And so here I was thinking, well, I love history and I, you know, love hearing the stories of women and I often find when I open a book like that, that it's, it's boring. And I think in large part because women like me are being told, you know, this isn't for you. Like you can read the books, but you don't get to write them. And so I felt like it was time, you know? And um, I know there was a, a secondary question there that was like, when did I feel closest to Dindy? Um, so for, and for those of you that don't know, so uh, Dindy is Virginia Hall's childhood nickname. So that's just, once you get to know her, that's all you can really call her. Um, but, you know, with this book coming out, 
there's been, and this sounds like, oh, chip on her shoulder. It's not, it's not that. I've done the inner work. It's all good. Um, but a lot of invisibility with this book, you know, um, my publisher informed me that there was no marketing budget for the book, for example. It's not that they didn't do anything, but there was no money to market the book. Um, it's really hard to share a book with the world when there's no marketing money for it, right? Um, and even me saying that makes me nervous. Like, oh, I'm going to be in trouble. No one's ever going to publish me again. Whatever. It's true, right? Um, there have been so many bookstores that I've emailed um, and said, hey, you know, I have this book and I'm local. Never heard back. Um, you know, there's all these other ways that the book just hasn't gotten visibility. And yet I'm hearing from readers who are like, oh my God, I love Virginia Hall so much. Like, why don't we know her story? I loved reading the book this way. I feel like I'm going to go out and kick ass and I feel empowered. And then that holy theory comes back up because I'm like, here we are again. Here's a vehicle through which women can feel empowered and capitalism, whatever the hell is saying, no, 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 you don't get that. Here's David McCullough. There you go. That's what you get. You know, no offense. To him. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's where I'm at. Yeah, and I think it's, it's interesting how your experience of publishing the book has echoed Dindy's own experience of being shut out um, in her career in the State Department. And, you know, you're, um, you have this wonderful line. And this is why I keep saying, like, this book is such an inspirational, like, choice for not just young readers, but, you know, readers of any age. A true badass sees defeat as an opportunity for different victories. And I just, I think about that line all the time because you're not gonna give up, you know, no matter how much indifference you encounter. I mean, we've got a lot of people, people who, who people watching this are gonna, most of them know enough about the publishing industry to know that like, it's annoying, but this is the industry, this is the way it works. And well, we're not gonna give up, you know, we just have to keep going. And, you know, in the face of, of indifference, misogyny, um, what, one thing I did want to point out, though, when you're talking about feeling invisible, um, you, you acknowledge, though, that um, Dindy's status as a, you know, she was disabled, but she was a white woman with a lot of economic privilege, um, that she was able to achieve all of this stuff in her life because of the privileges that she did have. And I think it's, so that's one of the things that I love about this book most is how you contextualize her privilege um, and make it make her story relevant for 21st century readers who on the surface might not see themselves reflected in her at all. Yeah, so and I think for and my own privilege, right? Like, yeah. I mean, the yeah. fact that I'm sitting here and saying, I feel invisible, but it's like, okay, but you have a book out with Simon & Schuster, shut the hell up, you know? Yeah. So it's right. like, it's layers, right? And one of the things that I talk about had been women of color, she never would have had that opportunity to be a spy in France. Like it yeah. never would have happened. And she wouldn't have been recruited. Right. She wouldn't have had that opportunity to have the education, to go learn French. You know, that's super fancy. Even now it's super fancy, you know? So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's a big part of it too, is like that intersectionality, right? She's disabled, but she's white. What does that mean? She's disabled and a woman, but she's American. What does that mean? You know? So, yeah. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> moving on to, uh, cause I, I wanted to, to mention your publisher's weekly article. Mm. Oh my gosh. Okay. We're back. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> you, you can see me, right? This is like, yeah, I can so see weird. you. Uh, my, my phone. I'm sorry, folks. I have an old phone. Um, we're, we're doing the best we can. So, um, if let's you just blame are... Mark Zuckerman and be done with it. <laughs> What's that? I said, let's just blame Facebook and be done with it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. 
Zuck is the worst. It's Silicon okay. Valley's fault, not ours. <laughs> so if you want to read Heather's amazing article that was published, published in Publishers Weekly last week, Making the Past Relevant by Diversifying Biographies, drop a blue heart in the chat and I will DM you that article, that link to that article. So let's go to uh, Chantal's other question, which is, have you read another biography that was written in a comparable style to yours? Um, well, she says of Virginia Hall, but I mean, in gen I mean, uh, any kind of biography also. Um, most biographies, I guess, are written by historians, not novelists, which I think this is like the reason that your book is so compulsively readable reads like a novel is because you are a novelist. Um, hence the dry style written by historians, not novelists. To me, it seems history written by novelists would be much more accessible to everyone, especially young people. Um, so are there any other biographies that you have encountered that have this more, um, you know, dynamic, um, entertaining approach to history without losing all of the you know, the, the, the impeccable research. Yeah. Um, so there's an author named Mallory O'Meara and she wrote a book called the lady from the black lagoon. And it's about the woman who was the designer, um, of the, like the makeup and the, the mask work of the creature from the black lagoon. And Mallory is really interesting because she is a filmmaker. Um, and she actually has a new book coming out too about, um, the history of women and alcohol, which is really cool. Um, and she writes in a similar style to me. Um, and what I also love about her book, it also infuses a lot of memoir. So she's, she's combining, you know, she's, she's drawing that bridge between, you know, a, his, a, a figure from real life that we want to read about and learn about and the challenges they face and how that's relevant to her own life and the challenges she faces as a woman in Hollywood. And um, yeah, and it's really good. And her, her, her style is really engaging. Of course, um, the, uh, the one about um, RBG, Notorious RBG, really great um, as well. Um, and that one, I think they ha actually had Ruth Bader Ginsburg's permission and, and had like worked a little bit with her on that. Right. So um, that's a little bit different because it's a little bit more like, you know, in real time. Um, I feel like there, I'm seeing, you know, people like Sarah Vowell and um, I can't remember the name of the author, but there's a new one about George Washington, which is a great title. You never forget your first. Um, I love it. <laughs> right. So there's, there's all these cheeky, you know, um, incredibly fiercely intelligent women out there who are finding their way in. And the way that I talk about it in the, um, the Publishers Weekly article is that, like, I'm not the first person to do this by any means. There just aren't many of us on this road. And I want to see more. And I don't want, you know, what I would like to not see, let's say, is... Um, that when women write about other women in a way that is engaging and um, colloquial, that it's not just a coffee table book that's like sparsely researched and has cool illustrations. And there's like a little bit of information and that's it. Like, I love seeing, you know, and I loved doing, you know, a biography where I had to do deep archival research and, I mean, I was reading Gestapo interrogation reports. I went to the CIA, you know, like deep stuff that, you know, I wasn't just like, oh, let me learn a little bit about this woman and then like wing it. You know what I mean? Um, so I hope this gives more women permission to kind of explore, you know, this, this whole new approach to the genre that I think women in the past, let's say 10, 15 years have been really trying to, you know, forge this path. Yeah, I love the marriage of the scholarly and the irreverent, you know, like reflecting real culture now and making it fun. There's nothing to say that something can't be, a work cannot be both scholarly and a whole lot of fun. Well, and, and I mean, look at Ben Franklin, like talk about somebody who is intelligent and like super irreverent, you know, I mean, this isn't, 
this has been happening all throughout history. And at some point people decided like, you know, let's be like super stodgy and buttoned up and like, you know, I mean, who decided that? I mean, obviously a white man, but you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. (laughs) So if you get the chance to write another one of these yummy biographies, have you thought about who you would write about? Yeah. Okay. I I have. I don't want to pressure you, but if you want to share, that would be fun. No, yeah. I mean, uh, will somebody publish it is the question, right? That's always the question. Um, but I, uh, there's two female journalists, uh, foreign correspondents that I really want to write about. Um, and I'm kind of thinking about the book being a conversation, like a biographical conversation between these two very different women. Um, one is very familiar to anyone who knows anything about journalism, Martha Gellhorn, Um, who was uh, famous for hiding in the privy of a ship during D-Day and sneaking onto the beaches at Normandy because women weren't allowed to be foreign correspondents. Um, At the same time, a woman named Dickie Chappelle was um, sneaking onto the beaches of Japan to report on Iwo Jima. So both of these women are incredible. Um, Dickie was the first female war correspondent to die in combat. Uh, She died with the Marines during Vietnam. And um, she's a fascinating character. And like literally five people probably in the world know about her. I mean, very, very, very few people know about her. Um, And so I really want her story to come to light. And I really want to talk a lot about... um, gender and the military. So um, both my parents are Marines and my dad is a combat veteran with PTSD. And um, Dickie had PTSD and she actually carried a sidearm when she was reporting in Vietnam and she wanted to be a pilot um, and that area was barred from her. I think she wanted to be, be a Marine and that was barred to her. And so being a war reporter was the way she got um, to express that part of herself. And it's just, I really want to tell her story. And, and there is a biography actually written by a journalist about her that's quite good. It's just, um, you know, it's dense and um, it's, it's very readable, but you know, it's called Fire in the Wind if you're curious. And um, it was published in the nineties. So I'd like to bring my style to Dickie's story, but I also want to talk about Martha Gellhorn because she famously wrote um, a collection of her journalism called The Face of War, which if you haven't read is incredible. She's an incredible writer, um, just amazing writer. And, um, you know, she's on the other spectrum. She's very anti, she's very anti-war activist, whereas Dickie, like, came alive in a battle zone, right? So, um, yeah, I would just, I'd love to write that book, please please let me write that book, somebody. (laughs) You know, we we have to say here that like it costs, it's a lot of time and a lot of money in order to do this research. So it's not really, you know, for anyone thinking, well, you can self-publish it. Unfortunately, you know, economically, um, you know, you're just not able to do that unless you have a publisher's back, uh, the, the, you know, the backing of a publisher who's like willing to finance the research. So, um, but like, let, let's just let's, let's there. Just say that like they don't necessarily, right? Like, you know, a, this genre isn't sexy yet. Okay, I'm bringing sexy back for biographies, but my advance was very small for this book. Yeah, this, and they did not pay for the thousands of dollars it cost me to go live in France for a while in Lyon where Virginia Hall was, you know, organized and I had to go to England and do archival research. I had to go to DC. I had to go to Maryland, you know, I had to do all these things. And then, you know, your agent gets their cut and uncle Sam gets his cut and, you know, and, and through all of that, you know, you're doing PhD level, work. And Mm -hmm. in my case, you know, half of the documents were in French. Um, So the amount of work it requires, um, but also life experience to be able 
to have the education and um, I'm, you know, I've lived abroad and stuff. So I felt comfortable going abroad. Not everybody feels comfortable. My husband came with me and I was lucky that he was able to help me. Um, you know, it's, this is such, such difficult work and it needs to be given the funding that these, you know, big, like, fantasy and I've written a fantasy trilogy I've written a big fantasy trilogy so there, you know no shame in that game I loved it you know but it all these resources are going to these kinds of books and then the people who have to do all this work they're not getting the funding so again I did just we just need so much reform in every area and for women to tell the stories of other women it's so hard it's so hard and I don't, I don't know how to fix that, but I'm trying. <laughs> You're doing your part and I'm so, I'm so blessed to know you. I'm so happy that you let me read an advanced copy of this wonderful book. What did I do with the, oh, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. For, I know you're super busy. Um, so thank you for taking the time to chat with me about your wonderful book, Codename Badass. Everybody buy it for your friends and family for Christmas. Um, Yay. Take a minute and um, talk about uh, what's going on with you this weekend. Um, this weekend. Oh, yeah. I was just is it, is it, winking it, about. Yeah. Or, yeah, no, this, yeah. Yeah. This weekend is I'm leading a meditation retreat for writers. Um, so it's a mindfulness for writers retreat with. We're going to breathe, write, and repeat, basically. We're going we're gonna to sit. We're going to do delicious writing exercises. We're going to be super nourished. And um, I'm hoping just it'll be a great time in this, this shift of the season. So, you know, when you have something like a holy fury, you've got to take care of yourself. And this is one way that you do it, right? And this is one way that you feel the well and you're able to – have the energy to put your words into the world um, and to be inspired and to not lose hope, which you talk about so much, Camille. And I'm so grateful for the ways that you hold space for writers in your, you know, your every Friday, you're doing your office hours. You know, if you have, if people haven't read Life Without Envy, they must, must read that book because that's how I met you. <laughs> uh, emailed you and now you're one of my best friends. So, um, Yay! Um, but yeah, so we're doing that retreat, and I'm really, really excited about it. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to see what comes out of it. You know, I hope the people that attend will keep me posted because this is big work that we do. You know, I feel like I really, really. I mean, I'm gonna be there, and I am really looking forward to it because I feel like I I need it more than I know. Like I have that sense. <laughs> <laughs> like on the other side of it, I'm going to be like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Um, <laughs> so if you are watching this video after Saturday, November 6th, 2021, no worries. I'm sure Heather will be offering another retreat like this in the future. So you just want to get on her mailing list. Um, so Heather, your Instagram will be linked in the info about this video. So, uh, click on her username and, um, uh, follow through the link in her bio to sign up for her mailing list. Your mailing list is, I mean, your, your, your email newsletter is amazing. Um, always super nourishing and inspiring. So, you, I mean, even if, you know, you think, oh, you know, all day virtual retreats, not for me, it, you know, you should definitely be on her list because it's, it, it makes my day. Like every time you send out an email newsletter, it makes my day. And not just because you're one of my besties, because it's amazing and inspiring. And I love you. I love writing it. I love it so much. It's medicine well, for me tell. too. Here's Cersei, yeah, by absolutely. the way. And she came to say hi. <laughs> such a sweet kitty. my assistant she's such a sweet kitty well um thank you so much <laughs> for any any what's that oh we're having like tech stuff happening yeah we're having yeah well we're gonna we're gonna end this now yeah and i just
everybody for watching and thank you Heather for writing this marvelous inspiring book available where all books are sold my per my personal preference is bookshop.org but your local indie Amazon also, the audio book is really good because I know we have a book shortage right now and I mm, only good. listen to nonfiction on audiobooks. Um, I can't listen to fiction for some reason. So th mm. it's great. It's really, I, the narrator's awesome, you know, so that's a good option too. Yeah. Thank you so much, Heather. We will. Thank you. Or yes, yes, yes. Goodbye, world. Goodbye, Camille. <laughs>